I also get to teach on a topic that's really dear to my heart, the topic of kingdom citizenship. Now, I think it's safe to say that all of us here are citizens of a country, right? Most of us are citizens of Canada. My wife and I still have our U.S. citizenship. Before getting my U.S. citizenship, I had an Indian citizenship. And Valentina still has her Russian citizenship. But earthly citizenship can also come in other forms. Um, so many years ago, I had the joy of working for the greatest company on planet Earth, the Coca-Cola company. <laughs> Yeah, that's a picture of baby Joe Ash from many years ago. <laughs> but anyone who knows me will tell you that I love Coca-Cola. In fact, uh, the first time we pulled up to this church and I saw the Coke factory <laughs> next door, I was like, this is a sign from the Lord. <laughs> But let me tell you, when, when you work for Coca-Cola, you're not just a Coke employee. You're also a brand ambassador. You know, I still remember my onboarding training, my first day on the job. They took us to the corporate headquarters, the global headquarters in Atlanta. And uh, they put us in a bright red room. Um, and uh, they brought out a bunch of free Coke products, a bunch of free food. And then they brought in their corporate trainer. And their corporate trainer looks at us and the first thing she tells us is, you are now a member and a citizen of the global Coca-Cola family. Pretty cool to uh, you know, be a Coke fan and hear those words. And being a member of the Coca-Cola family, being a citizen of the global Coca-Cola family comes with privileges, right? Like free Coke. <laughs> That's a pretty good privilege. But it also comes with responsibilities. Yeah. So for example, one of the things that they tell you when you work for the Coca-Cola company is that when you walk into a room, you no longer just represent yourself now. Yeah. You represent the Coca-Cola company. Even when you're off the clock. So that means no eating at KFC. <laughs> no eating at Pizza Hut. No eating at Taco Bell. Why? because they sold Pepsi, that's why. <laughs> now, why do I share all this? You see, just like I was a citizen of Coca-Cola, and just like many of us are US or Canadian citizens, as Christians, you and I have another citizenship too. Amen. Our heavenly kingdom citizenship. And I would argue that our citizenship in God's heavenly kingdom will always be more important than any citizenship that the earth has to offer. Amen. Always. So what does it mean to be citizens of heaven here on earth? You see, so many of us reduce our faith to the bare minimum, right? So we do the bare minimum as Christians and we settle for the bare minimum. So many of us put our faith in Jesus and we think, you know what? I'm good. I'll go to church once a week. I'll go to life group maybe once a month. I'll uh, serve a church every now and then. I'll be a good Christian. I'll die and then I'll go to heaven. And that's it. I don't want anything more than that. I don't need anything more than that. I'm set. So many of us, after becoming Christians, we look at the brokenness and the injustices around us and we, and we think, you know what, I'm gonna keep my head down, be a good Christian, die, escape all the suffering, and run straight into heaven. And I'm good. I don't need to worry about these things. I don't need to worry about suffering and brokenness and sin on earth. Brothers and sisters, if that's you this morning, I want you to pay close attention to this message. Because I wanna show you from God's word that God has so much more for you. Amen. God has so much more for you. Amen. 
Jesus came to give us life and life to the fullest. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So why then do many of us settle for the bare minimum? Why do many of us feel perfectly content settling for less? So what does it mean to be citizens of heaven here on earth? Because here's the reality. God is in heaven. We are here on earth. And I hate to break it to you, but heaven is not a place on earth. So what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven here on earth? I'm going to try and answer this question by pointing us to Philippians chapter 3 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull out Philippians chapter 3. And I can tell that some of you are struggling with finding Philippians in your Bible. That's okay. I want you to think of this the next time a preacher asks you to find Philippians in your Bible. Think of this. Hopefully we have a picture for this. No worries if we don't. Well, I want you to think of goats eating paper cups. Goats eating paper cups. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. <laughs> You'll never forget it. Goats eating paper cups. But let me first pray for us. Father God, thank you for this joy of gathering around your word together after a great day at the beach yesterday. And so God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would minimize distractions, that your word would speak to our hearts in a, in a loud and clear way this morning. And now I'm gonna ask you if you're comfortable, you talk to God and you ask God to speak to you from his word this morning. Let's do that for a few moments. And now if you would, I'm gonna ask that you pray for me, that my words would be helpful in pointing you to God's word this morning. Let's do that for a few moments in our hearts. Well, Father, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. These are all heavy words, I know, and uh, it may seem really heavy in theology, but I think, I think we're ready for it this morning. So we're going to jump into God's word together in Philippians chapter 3. So verses 1 to 11 of Philippians chapter 3 are about justification, the price of our kingdom citizenship. Paul starts with a warning in verse 2. He says, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. Paul says, watch out three times. What's Paul saying here? Paul is warning us about false teachers in the church. You see, back then in the early church, there were a group of false teachers going around the Greek church. Uh, this group was called the Judaizers because they were Jewish Christians who were teaching the larger church that you had to be circumcised in order to be a citizen of God's kingdom. These were false teachers who were teaching the early church that they had to do stuff to be a part of God's covenant community. These were false teachers who were teaching that circumcision was the price of kingdom citizenship. But Paul tells us to watch out for these people because that is not the way of Jesus. You see, Every world religion, every world religion will tell you that you have to do stuff to earn your salvation. Every world religion will tell you that you have to do stuff to go to heaven. But what separates, the one thing that separates Christianity from every other world religion is the teaching that we can do nothing to earn our salvation what makes the good news of Jesus Christ so good and so revolutionary is the teaching that apart from receiving the forgiveness that Jesus offers to us, 
We don't have to do a single thing to be saved. Or as Philip Yancey says, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Because as our sister has reminded us in worship this morning, God's love for us is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, still, it's up to us if we actually want to accept this free gift and live our lives in a way that's worthy of this grace. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the sermon. Uh, let's keep reading. Let's see what Paul says about circumcision in verse 3. Paul says, We are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. I love what Paul does here. Paul flips the circumcision argument on its head by saying, We, the church, are the circumcision. We, the church, are God's covenant community. We, the church, are God's chosen people. We, the church, are God's holy nation. And then he says, do not put confidence in the flesh. Boast in Christ Jesus. Because you will fail yourself. Celebrity pastors will fail you. Christians will fail you. I will fail you. But you know the one person who will never fail you? Jesus. Amen. Jesus will never fail you. Well, let's see what Paul goes on to say in verses 4 to 6. He says, Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Paul is saying that if anyone can put confidence in the flesh, it's Paul. Yeah. If anyone can boast about his own achievements, his own family tree, yeah. it's Paul. Right. And then he starts listing his religious street cred you know, like Paul, many of us who grew up in the church think that we have our own religious street cred too, right? And we think that this religious street cred is going to help us in the eyes of God. So let me share my religious street cred with you. My family believes that we've been Christian for close to 2,000 years now. The person who brought the gospel to my ancestors in southern India was the Apostle Thomas. But here's something else that's cool about my family history. My family has been Pentecostal for four to five generations now. Since at least the 1880s, before the Azusa Street Revival, if you're familiar with that. In fact, this is a picture of my great-grandfather, Simon. Simon was a Pentecostal preacher and writer in southern India. Simon brought dozens of people to Jesus. And I've actually gotten to meet a couple of family members who came to Jesus because of Simon's ministry. I probably get my hairiness from Simon too. <laughs> but here's the thing. As awesome as Simon was, one day I'll have to stand before God and I'll have to give God an account of how I lived my life. And I can't stand before God and say, God, look at Simon. Look at how awesome Simon was. Look at all that Simon did. That should save me. I can't even take my own accomplishments. And I can't even stand before God and boast about my own accomplishments and say, God, look at my life. Look at, look at all the good that I did. Look at all the children I helped rescue with IJM. That's not how it works. All I can do on that day is stand before God and boast in Jesus, Amen. and in Jesus' sacrifice for me Amen. on the cross. And that's the only thing that will save me from God's wrath. 
Paul, someone who had every right to brag about his family, someone who had every right to boast about his own good deeds as a Pharisee, says in verses 7 to 8, But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ. Paul takes all of his accomplishments. He takes all of his achievements. He takes all of his family tree and he calls it dung. You know, the Greek word for dung is the word skubala. And skubala, literally translated, means poop. Now, if you want a more accurate translation, talk to Pastor Jerry or Pastor Paul. <laughs> but let me just say this. Skubala happens, okay? That's what skubala means. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, are you ready to suffer the loss of all things and consider them as scubala for the sake of gaining Jesus? What comforts in your life are you sacrificing right now so that you and others would gain Christ? What luxuries are you sacrificing in your life right now so that you and others would gain Christ? Or are you just doing the bare minimum? as a citizen of heaven. You know, just last Sunday, I was in London, Ontario, not the other London. That would be pretty cool though. But uh, I was in London with Valentina and uh, I was teaching at a church and uh, I was representing IJM. And right after my sermon, there was this young couple who came up to me, uh, probably in their twenties with four little kids. And uh, they said, you know what? You mentioned in your sermon that it costs IJM $10,000 to rescue children from the Philippines for one rescue operation. Well, we just looked at our bank account and we have exactly $10,000 in our savings account. So we want to do this. We want to take our entire savings account and we want to give it to God. And we want to give it to IJM so you can go rescue these children. Because it's all God's money. It's all God's money. Do you realize what happened here? This family decided that their kingdom citizenship was worth more than anything else on earth. This family decided that they don't want the bare minimum. This family decided that everything they had was scubala for the sake of gaining Jesus. Well, let's keep moving to verses 9 to 11. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. You and I, who call Jesus our Lord and Savior, are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen. Let me say that again. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You and I are not saved by our good works. We're not saved by our family trees, but we're saved by God's finished work through Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Because it's Jesus who pays the price of our kingdom citizenship. So that's justification, the price of kingdom citizenship, which can only be paid by Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Let's now move to sanctification, the model of our kingdom citizenship. But before we do that, let me just throw in a warning here. You see, I've come across so many Christians who take this teaching that we're not saved by good works, and they abuse that teaching. So they say stuff like, 
Why should I do good works if I'm not saved by good works? Just be a good Christian. Just preach the gospel. No need to seek justice. No need to do compassion and mercy ministries. No need to do good things. It's not good things that saved us, right? We're not saved by good works, so why do good works? But when they say that, they're taking Paul out of context. Because the same Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2. Here's what he says. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift so that no one can boast. Not from works. But read on what he says in verse 10. He says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. For good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Brothers and sisters, you and I are saved and given kingdom citizenship, not so that we can die in our sleep and go to heaven and escape from all the problems here on earth. You and I are saved for good works works, which God has prepared for each of us ahead of time for us to do. And that's what sanctification is. Sanctification is the process of becoming like the model of kingdom citizenship. And the model of kingdom citizenship is the king of the kingdom, whose name is King Jesus, by the way. And after we're saved, after we're marked as God's new creation in Christ for good works. You know, just yesterday, we as a church celebrated new baptisms, right? If, if you were baptized yesterday, can I just ask you to stand up for a second so we can celebrate you? Yeah, come on. So good, thank you, thank you. Go ahead, be seated. So great, so great. But here's the thing, right? Regardless of how long you've been baptized for, regardless of how long you've known Jesus for, here's what's important to remember. Putting our faith in Jesus and being baptized is just the beginning. It's just the beginning of a long process of sanctification here on earth. This is why it's important for us to be in church. This is why it's important for us to be in life group. Because that's where real change starts to take place. That's where we go from being a caterpillar to a butterfly in the kingdom. That's where we go from being a baby Christian to a mature believer in the kingdom. Because it's in the body of Christ where we're shaped into the image of Christ. Let me say that again. It's in the body of Christ where we're shaped into the image of Christ. Sanctification is the process of being made perfect in Christ. Paul says in verses 12 to 14, not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I have also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal, the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Here's Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a missionary of of missionaries, someone who has planted countless churches saying that he ain't perfect. And here's the thing, Paul wasn't perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But one day, we will be perfect if we don't give up. Paul forgets what is behind, and he keeps reaching forward to what is ahead. Paul is not settling for the bare minimum. Paul is not settling for the bare minimum. He wants more of Jesus, and he wants to be more like Jesus. Paul forgets what is behind and keeps reaching forward to what God has for him. 
Brothers and sisters, are you ready for more? Are you ready for more? Or are you satisfied with the bare minimum? God has more for you. And he wants you to be ready for more so that he can entrust you with more in your sanctification journey. So that's sanctification, the process of becoming more like Jesus. And I won't spend more time talking about sanctification because at the end of the day, sanctification isn't taught. It's caught. And it's caught in community. It's caught in life group. It's caught in church. So even as you take summer vacations and even as you do summer travel, can I encourage you to not give up on community? Can I encourage you to not give up on your life groups? Can I encourage you to not give up in sanctification? Because it's in the body of Christ where we're formed into the image of Christ. So we looked at justification, how we become kingdom citizens, which is through the blood of Jesus shed on, shed on the cross of Calvary for us. And we looked at sanctification, the process of becoming like model citizens, like the model citizen. King Jesus. Let's now talk about glorification, the purpose of our kingdom citizenship. We see glorification in verses 18 to 21. And I want you to catch this. Paul talks about two types of glorification in Philippians 3, verses 18 to 21. And he gets pretty emotional as he talks about the first kind of glorification, glorification in the flesh. He says, for I have often told you and say now again with tears that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. And they're focused on earthly things. A few weeks ago, Pastor Paul taught us from Galatians chapter 6 that we reap what we sow. Those who reap in the flesh, like the traffickers I talked about a few weeks ago, Those who reap in the flesh, those who sow in the flesh, will reap in the flesh. But those who sow in the spirit will reap in the spirit. Verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait for a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Paul contrasts the way of the world Glorification in the flesh with the way of kingdom citizenship. Glorification in Christ. So again, I come back to my original question. If our citizenship is in heaven and we are here on earth, what are we supposed to do on earth until Jesus returns? Do we just sit on our hands like the church of First and Second Thessalonians and do nothing? Expecting Jesus to show up and fix everything by himself? What does it mean for us to live as citizens of heaven here on earth? I'm going to answer this by highlighting three main points from these verses. Here's my first point. To be a citizen of heaven is to eagerly wait for our Savior from there. To be a citizen of heaven is to eagerly wait for our Savior from there. Now, many of us, when when we read this, when we read these verses... We take it as an excuse to not engage in the brokenness of this earth, to not engage in the injustices of this earth. Why? Because we're citizens of heaven. Why should we care about everything going on here on earth? But when we think this way, we're completely missing the point of what Paul was saying here when he was writing this to the church in Philippi. You see, the church that Paul was writing to was the church in Philippi. And I brought a map with me just to help explain this a little better. But if you look at the map, you'll see Philippi right under Macedonia. That's where Philippi is. And now I want you to look for Rome in Italy. We all know where Rome is. It's in Italy, right? But right there. Now look at the distance between Rome and Philippi. This is actually really far, especially when you had to travel by foot back in the day, right? So the church that Paul was writing to was the church in Philippi. And Philippi 
was a colony of Rome in Macedonia, in the Greek world. In fact, the people of Philippi were Roman citizens. They were full Roman citizens because they were descendants of Roman soldiers who were sent to Greece. So they were full citizens of Rome, but that didn't mean that they would one day go and escape and live in Rome. No, that, that wasn't the purpose of their citizenship in Philippi, in the Greek world. They were citizens of Rome in the Greek world so that they could bring Roman values to the Greek world. Let me say that again. They were citizens of Rome in the Greek world so that they could bring Roman values to the Greek world. So many of us take this passage out of context to mean that if we're citizens of heaven, we're going to one day escape from this earth into heaven permanently. So we look at injustice and we look at brokenness around us on earth and we think that I don't need to worry about this. This isn't my problem. This isn't the church's problem. It's not our responsibility. But when we do that, we're being unfaithful to our citizenship in heaven. Because to be a citizen of heaven on earth, to be a colony of heaven on earth, is to faithfully live out our heavenly values on earth as it is in heaven until Jesus returns. But here's something else about Roman colonies in the first century. The emperor would never show up to the colony. The emperor would never show up to the colony unless there was something terribly wrong. In which case the emperor would show up with his armies to bring justice and to make everything right again. And this is what Jesus will do on earth one day when Jesus returns. He'll show up with us, his army and his angel armies and he's gonna bring back justice here on earth. Which brings me to my second point. To be a citizen of heaven is to live in anticipation of heaven on earth. To be a citizen of heaven is to live in anticipation of heaven on earth. Because when Jesus returns, as we see in verse 21, he will transform the body of our humble conditions into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Glorification in Christ. You see, when Jesus returns, he will establish his kingdom on earth fully. This just kingdom that we see in Revelation where every tear is wiped away, where all oppression shall cease, and where God's justice is fully restored here on earth as it is in heaven. Or as N.T. Wright says, the Christian hope is not for pie in the sky when you die, but for the new heavens and the new earth where justice and righteousness dwell. Because what God did for Jesus at the resurrection, he'll also do for us one day. And what God will do for us one day, he'll also do for all of creation. Here's my third point. To be a citizen of heaven is to live an intentional life here on earth. To be a citizen of heaven is to live a life of intentionality here on earth. You know, as citizens of heaven, we live intentionally here on earth because living intentionally is a value of heaven. It's a value of our kingdom citizenship. We're called to live lives of intentionality because God the Father was intentional with us by sending us God the Son, Jesus, who intentionally laid his life down for us and sent us the Holy Spirit who intentionally comforts us and makes everything new with us until Jesus returns to bring heaven on earth. So what does it look like for us as CLC, as a colony of heaven in Brampton, to live lives of intentionality this summer? You know, a lot of us have summer plans. Uh, some of us are going to Cuba. Some of us are going to Cancun. Uh, some of us just came back from the Dominican Republic. Super jealous. 
Some of us are going to the Philippines. But we can still be intentional. We can be intentional with our prayers. We can be intentional with our finances. We can be intentional with our time. We can be intentional with our friendships. We can be intentional with evangelism and discipleship. We can be intentional with our social media. We can be intentional with our lives. And we must be intentional with our lives. Because ultimately, as kingdom citizens, as citizens of heaven here on earth, we're called to intentionally usher in heaven on earth. One prayer at a time, one life group at a time, one beach day at a time, one meal at a time, one child sponsorship at a time, one rescue operation at a time, on earth as it is in heaven. So today we looked at justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is the price of kingdom citizenship, the blood of Jesus. Sanctification is becoming like the model of kingdom citizenship, King Jesus. And glorification is the purpose of kingdom citizenship, which is advancing God's kingdom here on earth. You know, I loved getting to be a brand ambassador for Coca-Cola. But let's be real. What is Coca-Cola at the end of the day? It's the sugar water, right? I mean, it's really tasty, addictive sugar water. But it's still sugar water at the end of the day. You and I as kingdom citizens have been entrusted with something far greater than sugar water. You and I as kingdom citizens have been entrusted with the living water, Jesus. So may we be faithful to our kingdom citizenship here on earth until Jesus returns.